Hello, and thank you so much for being here today. I'd like to start out with a word of prayer. Father, I want to ask that you would be with this message, that you would be with me as I deliver it, and that your gospel truth would touch our hearts and our minds. We love you. Amen. Well, I would like to start today with a story. Many years ago, a young monk lived in a small college town in Germany. He was appointed as the chair of biblical studies at the school, and though he was bright and passionate, he was plagued by relentless anxiety. As he saw it, salvation rested in his own hands, and God's grace could only be attained by proper behavior and sufficient self-sacrifice. He was a miserable sinner. And as he later described that time in his life, he called it a living hell. Though he contemplated taking his own life, he refrained because he knew such an act would condemn him to an even deeper level of purgatory. Years later, however, this man would write the following words. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. You may recognize these words as the third stanza of the much-loved hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, written by Martin Luther. The joy and confidence in God expressed in this song contrast greatly with Luther's earlier misery and fear, raising the question, what prompted this transformation? Luther credited his discovery of Romans 1.17. I'll be reading from the NIV. Romans 1.17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This righteousness by faith transformed Luther's life. And thanks to Luther's unyielding declaration that righteousness is found through faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone, and to God's glory alone, the entire world was transformed as well. For 500 years, Protestants have celebrated this reality-altering doctrine of righteousness by faith alone. Yet for 2,000 years, humanity has marveled at how it could be true. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I'm going to repeat that. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Today, I would like us to grapple with this question. What makes justification by faith the power of God? And how could the power of God ever be seen as foolish? In order to answer this question, we must first ask, what is justification by faith? In order to understand how this one transformative idea can be seen as foolishness to some, and as the power of God to others, we need to understand what Paul even means when he speaks of it. Paul's letter to the Romans is especially suited to this task, as unlike his other letters, Romans was not written to address a certain behavioral problem or set of theological concerns. Because of this, Paul is able to go through his understanding of the gospel step by step in the manner of argumentation used by the Greek philosophers. In essence, Romans is the closest thing we have to an apostle's textbook on systematic theology. Paul spends the first two and a half chapters of the book detailing humanity's fall from God. The Jews abandon God's covenant law, and the Greeks defy God's natural law, leaving all humans subject to God's wrath and judgment according to the law. In essence, all of humanity is broken. And though we see this brokenness, we have no hope of repairing the damage on our own. Under the law, or the picture of what a whole humanity looks like, we're only made more aware of how utterly unwhole we are. We are not empowered to fix it. 
Paul expresses this problem in chapter 3, verse 20 of Romans. He says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But he continues, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came in Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did so to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. All right, so Paul gives us a lot of information there, but let's see if we can break it down. First, Paul tells us that God has made his own righteousness known to us. How did he do this? The answer lies in verse 25. So let's go back to verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. Jesus is God's revelation of his righteousness. In Paul's view, the law was broken and a price needed to be paid. So God demonstrated his righteousness by taking on human flesh, living according to the law, and then giving himself up as a sacrifice on our behalf. Furthermore, by becoming human and embodying the law to its fullest extent, Jesus raised the standards of the law, rendering us even more incapable of being righteous on our own. Previous editor of the Adventist Review, William Johnson, puts it this way in his article, God's Way of Righteousness. Jesus raised the bar of righteousness so high that the whole system of attempting to please God by scrupulous attention to detailed observances collapsed under its own weight. Thus, the life of Jesus makes us aware both of God's incredible righteousness and of our lack thereof. Second, Paul tells us that this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Since the law could not save us, but could only make us more aware of how far from God we are, we needed something, or rather, someone other than the law to save us. In other words, in his life, Jesus united himself to the Father through perfect obedience to the law. In death, Jesus united himself to mankind and slaughtered our sinful nature by taking on our sin. So this is justification by faith. Because of Jesus' perfect life and sacrificial death, we are restored to wholeness in Christ through faith in him. It is upon recognizing this that we must take a moment to grapple with its absurdity. Because it is absurd, the idea of the innocent paying for the guilty, of the creditor forgiving the defaulted debtor, the story is told of a gambler who, through a series of bad hands and supreme financial folly, owed a lender a hundred million dollars. When the lender began to settle his accounts, he called the gambler into his office, as anyone would do. Looking at his tax returns and seeing that the gambler could not pay his debt in a hundred lifetimes, the lender told him his assets would be frozen and his car and home repossessed. Frantically searching for a way out, but still not grasping the gravity of the situation, the man pleaded, be patient with me. I have a big poker match coming up on Tuesday, and I can give you a good down payment after that. <laughs> Seeing the man's desperation and complete inability to pay, the lender took pity on him, canceled his debt, and let him go. 
let's pause for a moment because this story is ridiculous. It would not happen. To operate a business in this manner is both unfair and absurd. However, we find this story, or a version of it, in the first half of the parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18. We'll get to the second half of my revised version in a minute, but for now, I just want us to grasp how ludicrous this lender's bookkeeping was. The word Paul uses to describe it is foolish, which brings us back to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, and Paul's statement that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Foolishness. But the latter part of this verse is crucial to those who are perishing. And this phrase, to those who are perishing, will inform the latter half of our parable. Leaving the office, the gambler saw a homeless man who owed him $100. You, he said to the man, where are my $100? The man responded, I'm so sorry. Times have been tough, but I get my social security check tomorrow and I can get it to you then. Nonsense, said the gambler. I'll just take your coat and your shoes instead. Please, said the homeless man. It's the middle of winter and these are the only warm clothes I own. You should have thought of that before you asked to borrow my money, said the gambler. Seeing this interaction from the front window, the lender's secretary told him what she had witnessed. Outraged, the lender called the gambler back. You evil, heartless man, he said. I canceled your debt because I knew you couldn't pay it back. And then you, a man with a home and a car and a canceled debt, could not show even a fraction of that mercy to a man with no home and no car and no place to lay his head. Say goodbye to your house, your car, and your livelihood. The gambler did not understand that his debt had been canceled. He left the lender's office still paralyzed by fear, still counting pennies and debts owed to him because he was still trying to figure out a way to relieve himself of his impossible burden. He was so blinded by his debt that he couldn't see the grace that had already been given to him. As a result, he could not extend grace to the man that owed him because to do so would have been foolish. When we are dying under the weight of the law, when we insist on working and striving to pay a debt that we can never repay, the prospect that another will pay that debt for us is foolish. When we are still playing the old game, of comparing ourselves to the standard of the law to see if we can measure up when we manage to kid ourselves into believing that we can be good enough, of course grace is foolish. In order to fully receive grace, in order to be invited into the new expanding reality of God's love, in order to be justified by faith, we have to be willing to admit that we cannot do this on our own, we cannot do this according to what the law offers. Otherwise, we doom ourselves to a life of attempting to repay an impossible debt that we no longer owe. We have to acknowledge that the law will only ever show us how desperately we are perishing. As early Adventist theologian A.T. Jones writes in his book, lessons on faith. When a person sees himself as so ungodly as to find there is no possible ground of hope for justification, it is just there that faith comes in. in indeed, it is only there that faith can possibly come in. We have to be humble enough to admit that we are incapable of paying our debt before faith is allowed to come in. But when we allow this faith to come in, it comes in as the power of God. 
because God isn't interested in making sense to finite minds wrapped up in good bookkeeping and balanced accounts. God is interested in radical, incomprehensible grace. Let's pick up in 1 Corinthians once more, chapter 1, verse 19. Paul says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, Paul is quoting from Isaiah 29, verse 14. And I think it would be worth our time to go back and look at the context of this verse. The entire chapter is declaring judgment on David's city for her injustice and for not understanding what God really wants of her. Verse 13, the verse preceding Paul's quote, begins God's personal message. So we're in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. The Lord says, These people come near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. It seems that the problem of attempting to appease God through meeting the letter of the law while neglecting a relationship with him is not unique to our day or even to Paul's. God has ever been calling us to forego our bookkeeping, to forego our attempts to measure up in favor of drawing close to his heart and grace. And now we come to the verse that Paul quotes in Isaiah 29, verse 14. Therefore, once more, I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will perish. The intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Paul reflected on the incredible righteousness of Christ and astounded by the grace that he had received. He was reminded of the Hebrew scriptures that he knew so well. God has always superseded worldly wisdom in favor of perplexing us with grace. And Paul, moved by his own experience, tells us that when we allow ourselves to receive this grace, when we allow God to justify us through faith, we experience the power of God. And what do we have power over when we have the power of God? I'm going to discuss three realms over which we can see the power of God working in our lives when we accept this justification by faith. First, the power of God is power over sin, death, and fear of eternal punishment for our lack of measuring up. This is what Martin Luther experienced when he discovered justification by faith. This is what took him from what he called a, quote, living hell to spearheading the Protestant Reformation with the assertion that we are saved by grace through faith. When we accept that we have been justified by faith, we are free from death's despair and from hell's fear. We know that death is but temporary, and though we grieve at loss and at tragedy, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, quoting Hosea, Where, O death, is your sting? Where, O death, is your victory? So first, justification by faith is the power of God over the grip of sin and death. But the power of God is not limited to power over our eternal fate. The power of God is power over that which enslaves us while we are still alive. This brings us to the second realm in which we can witness the power of God. This side of eternity, here 
and now. Division, hate, oppression, addiction, so much enslaves us, especially when we see ourselves as being responsible for our own salvation. When my entire universe revolves around me, when the weight of the world rests on my shoulders, of course there's no grace or love to extend to another. But justification by faith says no to a self-centered existence. Justification by faith glorifies the work not of our hands, but of Jesus. Ellen G. White said it this way, when men learn they cannot earn righteousness by their own merit of works, and they look with firm and entire reliance upon Jesus Christ as their only hope, there will not be so much of self and so little of Jesus. Oh, how badly we need less of self and more of Jesus in our hearts, our church, and the world. It reminds me of the song we all grew up with. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. When Jesus becomes the center of all we do, when he becomes our source of strength and joy and righteousness, the things that divide us grow strangely dim because the thing that unites us is that we have all been redeemed in Christ. Justification by faith demands full dependence on our righteousness in Christ, requiring us to, in the words of Ellen White, put away a controversial spirit. In this way, Justification by faith becomes the power of God in this life, moving us from division, hate, and oppression to justice, love, and generosity. But this move toward harmony with each other cannot happen if we are still at war with ourselves. Yes, justification by faith is the power of God over sin and death. Yes, justification by faith is the power of God over hate and oppression. But lastly, justification by faith is the power of God over our hearts, over our fears, over our shame, unrest, and addiction. Sorry. I have experienced this power, but it takes daily, sometimes moment by moment surrender to the grace of Jesus. Fear and worry have been a lifelong battle for me. I can remember lying awake at night at age seven, thinking about my spelling test the next day. Or studying for my eighth grade history exam like my life depended on it. Even now, I go to bed at night before an organic chemistry exam with images of molecules and carbon-carbon bonds breaking and reforming as they float through my mind. Stress has always been a struggle. However, when I take an honest look at my struggle, it becomes evident that a desire for control lies at the root of my fear. My early childhood involved a series of unfortunate familial circumstances. And I think I came to crave control as a means of preventing further painful, life-altering changes, as if it could. A part of me mistakenly came to believe that if I could just work hard enough if I could just achieve enough, if I could just make enough people around me proud, then I could be secure. I could avoid losing those I love. I could ensure financial security. I could silence all of the what if questions. Justification by faith continually calls out the lie in this mentality. When I fear what I would be if I were to fail, Justification by faith tells me, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. When anxiety clouds my mind with thoughts of my own inadequacy, justification by faith reminds me, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. 
Justification by faith removes me from the center of my universe, makes Jesus my all, assures me of my salvation, and calms the tempest of fear in my heart. Justification by faith is the power of God over unrest in our inner lives as well. We live in a broken world full of oppression, injustice, and hurting people. And yet, we've been given a profound gift. Some, those who are perishing, might call it a foolish gift. But we who are experiencing it, we who are accepting the grace of Jesus, we who are justified by faith, we call it the power of God. May you know that you are profoundly loved by the creator of the universe, justified by faith in his outrageous gift to you. May you experience the power of God over sin and death. May you experience the power of God over hate and discord. May you experience the power of God over the shame and fear within your own heart. And may we all walk in faith as we await his return. Amen.